In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Our chaplain's report today does come from the book of Daniel. We'll be con uh, continuing our, our study. You know, we're actually kind of winding down on Daniel. We've been on this for a while because it's an important book and it just has a wealth of, of knowledge in it and, and wisdom in it. So we spent a lot of time on it, but I think that it's been well worth it. And I think that today is, of course, no exception. We're moving into chapter 10 today. And just to give you a little bit of context, because the first part of this chapter is, is primarily narrative. So Daniel has some kind of wisdom, something that he doesn't understand from God, and he wants a better understanding of the things that, that he's seeking out. And so as a response to this, what Daniel does is he enters into a time of fasting. And this is about as extreme a fast as it gets. I mean, it's not quite Jesus in the desert for 40 days, but... It's pretty, I mean, it, it's pretty insane. If this were a, if you if fast uh, if fasting were a workout program for Daniel, this would be the CrossFit of workout programs. This is the P90X of fasting. So what Daniel does is for three full weeks, twenty one days, Daniel decides to eat no food, drink no water, and it says that no oil had come upon his head. What that's saying is, because you have to keep in mind the, the location that they were in, basically what he's saying is that he's not bathed. I mean, he has basically broken himself down to the bare bones and has focused strictly on praying to God for three full weeks. And I got to commend him on that. I mean, it's just amazing one of the things that's important to note here is the Bible says that he ate no tasty food. In other words, that kind of implies that he may have had a, a morsel here and there just to keep himself going, to keep his energy up, but he was not eating anything for pleasure. So, for example, to put it into our terms, maybe, and this was a common practice amongst Jews, that when they would fast, they wouldn't completely forego food, but they would forego any food that they would enjoy. So maybe he's eating something very bitter, um, eating something that'll kind of keep him going, but not much else. And so Daniel has taken this extreme measure to try to put himself in a spiritual mindset to improve his ability to understand and to implore God to grant him the understanding that he's seeking. And so that's really where we find ourselves. And at this point, at the 21st day, he sees a man wrapped in linen, I guess could be Gabriel, if you'll remember from the last passage that it, it was specifically named that it was Gabriel that gave him the explanation of the prophecy then. But that seems somewhat unlikely, because if it were Gabriel a second time, why wouldn't he notice him? Like, wouldn't he recognize Gabriel since he's already seen Gabriel once? And so it's more than likely another angel, but we don't know that for sure. All it says is it's a man that is, is wrapped in linen cloth. And so let's go ahead and look at the passage that we're going to talk about, because this is what the, the man, uh, whoever he is, the messenger that is wrapped in linen cloth, probably an angel, says to Daniel here. And this is in Daniel 10, verse 12. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding, this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. A couple things that I want you to really notice about this. First of all, I love how he starts it out with, Do not be afraid, Daniel. And I don't know, I guess it's even possible that this messenger is Christ. And if it is, there would certainly be a consistency there. Because you'll remember that when the storm is raging with the apostles the night that Peter walked on water, that Jesus came to them and the first thing that he said was, do not be afraid. It's just such a, a fatherly thing 
for God to, whether it's God himself or one of his messengers, that when he starts communicating with his children, the first thing he wants to do is calm the fear in their hearts, to reassure them. It's just a very fatherly instinct that he has, and I think it's one that he instilled in all of us trying to make us understand what it's like to be him. And so I really love that he starts out with, do not be afraid. And then proceeds to give him the message that he is intent on giving to him. So there's a couple things I want to point out here because we don't actually get into the message. We've only looked at the introduction, but I think even in the introduction, there's a lot of good information that we can sort of take out of this. First of all, you'll notice that he said that Daniel has been humbling himself. And I think that that's an important lesson for us to learn because I do think that Christians ought to fast. I don't fast nearly as enough uh, as much as I think that I should. And I think that it was something that was such an integral part of the Christian faith for a long time. And I think that maybe our culture of over overindulgence has kind of deadened that and removed it. Now, the Bible also talks about when you fast, make sure that you're trying to conceal it, that you're not trying to fast so that you will get praise from other people. So for all I know, there's all kinds of Christians fasting all the time, and I'm just unaware of it because that's part of the command. But it seems to me more likely that a lot of Christians simply don't fast. And that really is a shame because it is something that is incredibly spiritually enriching, and it's something that's kind of a lost art form in Christianity, at least Christianity here in the U.S., but I think that it points out that the point of fasting is humility. You see, ironically, I think that Christians here in the United States of America, we may be the ones that need fasting the most, ironically enough. That because we tend to think of ourselves as being self-sufficient and as being able to take care of ourselves, and because we're not constantly met with the fear of our own mortality, we don't have to worry about our, where our next meal is coming from. We're not afraid that, you know, like in some of the, the, more, uh, the more barbaric parts of the world, that people from the other village are just going to all of a sudden rise up and attack. We don't live with that cloud of doubt hanging over our head, which in a lot of ways is a good thing. I think that that's something that's positive. But I also have to wonder if it is at least in some ways, robbed us of our own sense of relying on God. I think in many ways it has. When we were a far more agrarian community, when we were a more agrarian society, we had to rely on God a lot more because it didn't matter how well off you were, one year could ruin you if you didn't get enough rain. And so that dependency on God, that reliance on Him to lean on Him for support, is something that is largely lost on a lot of people in our culture. I know sometimes it's lost on me too. And so one of the instructive parts of this passage is that God's messenger is, is letting Daniel know that right here, what is going on is that Daniel's words have been heard in part because he humiliated himself. Now, God's not a magic gumball machine. He doesn't grant requests, okay, if you do this, this, and this, and you fill out this checklist, I'm going to give you what you want. That's not the point. The point is that Daniel took measures to humble himself, to curb his own human animus and pride, and to rely solely on God and to make his spirit hunger after him and to depend on him and that attitude is really what led to God answering. But there's an even more important part about that. You'll notice that in this same passage, that he says, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for the, from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. You see, that's a powerful lesson for us. We would look at that 
maybe with our 21st century lenses and see really took God 21 days to give him an answer. God knew Daniel was plan- uh, what he was doing on day one. And God's God, he knew what was going to happen. So why would make him wait that long? You see, sometimes when we pray, whether we're fasting or not, whether it's something big or something little, whether it's something that's, that's laying on our mind and our heart and we pour ourselves out to God for a long period of time, or whether it's, it's something that we ask almost in passing, there's something that we need to remember is that because God can see all of time and because God knows us, he will answer our prayer when he believes it's most opportune. There's a great line that I think about from one of my favorite movies starring Sean Astin, Rudy. I'm sure most guys have seen that movie. Probably most women, too. And there's a really, really great line where Rudy is trying to get into Notre Dame, and he's talking to the Catholic priest, and I think this is the best line of the whole movie, and that's saying something, because I love this movie. But he's talking to the priest there, and he says, maybe I haven't prayed enough. In other words, he hasn't gotten the response that he wanted. He hasn't gotten into Notre Dame yet. And so his natural assumption is, I guess I haven't prayed enough. And the priest, who knows Rudy pretty well and knows how much he's been praying, he says, I'm sure that's not the problem. And then later he says, prayer is something we do in our time. The answer is come in God's time. That's what we're seeing right here in Daniel. God was with Daniel from day one. He knew what was happening. He knew what Daniel was doing. Yet he waited to answer until day 21. Why? I'm not sure that I understand every aspect of this answer, but I do know for certainty that if God waited 20 days, he had a good reason. And whatever that reason is, that my finite human mind not, may not even be capable of comprehending. He did so because it was in Daniel's best interest and the best interest of everybody else. And so what we're seeing here, I think is very encouraging to the person who has been praying for something for a very long time and feels like God isn't hearing them. God is hearing you. Maybe he'll answer you one day, maybe he won't. Might be 20 minutes from now, might be 20 years from now, might not ever happen. But God will give an answer when he feels the time is most opportune. For Daniel, maybe he needed to be humbled. Maybe he needed to go through this experience to be spiritually prepared for the message that God was going to give him. I don't know. But God knows, and that's enough for me. I trust my Lord enough, and that he knows me well enough to know when I am ready to accept an answer for a prayer that I've given. Or maybe a prayer that doesn't need to be answered at all. God answers every prayer. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's an answer we don't like, but it is answered. But the point is, Daniel trusted God enough that for that entire 21-day period, he continued to put himself through that because he believed that God was listening. And that faith was rewarded in God's messenger saying, God was with you from day one. He heard you, but he still waited until this point to give you the answer. Daniel trusted God And so should we. Stay the course, friends. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist, which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.